bringing you another fine podcast from Art Report Today. My name is Michael Delgado, and I'm on special assignment for Art Report Today. My guest tonight is the artist Yugo Zhou, a Chinese-born, Chicago-based artist whose videos and installations address connections, isolation, and longing across urban and natural environments. Those are big themes, to be sure, but Zhou is somehow able to make them intimate and personal. She's involved in recent international cyber arts festivals such as Cyber Arts and Ars Electronica in Austria this summer. Joe is currently an artist at New Inc. in New York City. It's the world's first museum-led incubator for art, technology, and design, and it was founded by the new museum there in 2014. Admittedly, I'm a fanboy, which is odd because I typically don't like video or time-based art. The green fee can be way too high. Take, for instance, Paul McCarthy's films. You know, they're excruciating, which is not to say I don't like the work. I'm a huge fan of, of, of McCarthy's, too. But Joe's work, in contrast, is quite beautiful and painterly. They're meditative. I can spend a lot of time with the pieces. A recent piece titled East of the Day, West of the Night depicts sunrise and sunset on opposite sides of the Pacific. The moving images, in which the horizon line splits the projection, is so simple and yet packed with detail and emotion. I was reminded of a Rothko painting. Oh my god, that was exactly um, the concept. You know, it's a moving oh, Mark okay. Rothko painting. Yes. Oh, well good, I'm glad I found that. <laughs> and, and, and then, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I used to live in Minneapolis and I uh, would spend a fair amount of time at the um, Institute of Art there. Have you ever been there? No, I don't think so. I, I want to go, though. I heard uh, very nice things about the art museum there. Yeah, there's two. Well, the Walker Center is really nice, but the museum has, uh, the Institute of Art there has a really fine collection of Chinese paintings and mm -hmm. uh, other and, uh, and other pieces. Um, and so, like, is it Green Play, I think it's called, yes. your piece? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. That reminded me of, like, uh, Chinese scroll paintings, um, yeah, you know, yeah, whereas different exactly. events sometimes. So yeah. I don't know if that's or not or how you yeah. think about Yeah, that's actually, well, I mean, uh, you're uh, you so great. I mean, you just get my word immediately. Uh, I, I think, you know, like you said, my work is meditative. So it's kind of rooted in the Chinese philosophy that seeks to find peace beneath the uh, the turbulence of everyday life, and uh, also my composition, uh, like the the work you saw, green play, uh, is definitely influenced by the traditional Chinese scroll painting. Um, there's like multiple events happening at the same time, and mm -hmm. I kind of collaged time and space uh, together onto like the same canvas, so the audience can you know look at the the scene and. Uh, experiencing different narratives and just go through one small event one from another and uh, it's it's a collage of time and space yeah i think uh one one way to think about it is uh it's kind of like a non-linear narrative so you can look at the events uh at your own pace and, and the, mm. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't need to have a beginning and an end. Uh, so everything's kind, kind of happening simultaneously, but it's up to the viewers to, to, you know, to see which event is the one that they want to, to look at first and, and then next. So the, the viewer is part, it's becoming kind of like a participant in the whole story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that's kind of an interesting aspect of the, of my work and also the Chinese traditional score paintings. In other work, Zhou's penchant for collage has drawn parallels to a cubist style. And I asked her if this was accurate. Yeah, I think one of the Western influence for me is obviously the cubist movement. Uh, mm. And I think it's similar to the Chinese uh, scroll painting. That I think for, for cubist um, style, it, you can also um, perceive an object uh, 
all a story kind of from multi- multiple vantage points. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it becomes like three-dimensional in, in that way. Um, so I think um, my my work, my collage work, definitely uh, echoes that kind of techniques, um, also the aesthetics of the Cubist paintings. Another thing uh, I'm very inspired to is um, um, the modernist relief and how kind of sculpture merge into its environment. So for some mm-hmm. of my video installation projects, I I built um, large relief panels onto the wall, uh, and I project the video onto the reliefs. So it creates this uh, three dimensionality and like physicality uh, mm. with the you know the digital aspect of the video. So so when the viewer walk into the gallery space, uh, they kind of slowly see um, the video from like a flat image and as they walk closer to the installation it becomes like this three dimensional uh type of moving you know moving image mm-hmm. uh, so it's it creates this uncanny uh sense you know of uh, um just gives gives the work like an uncanny perspective yeah so like in under what is it underground I yeah it's underground circuit and uh, another piece meet on flutter um, so both pieces has this sculptural aspect. Yeah, the underground, I, as I recall, it has uh, like there's a cube in the middle that that you yeah. can actually sit on. You can sit on it, right? Or exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That. yeah. So 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 uh. for 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 that piece, it's it's kind of really about you know how like inviting the viewer to be part of the work. So when they mm-hmm. sit on the cube, they immediately become part of the librarians. So the work itself is kind of like this uh, uh, infinite loop of uh, um, people walking in the subway station. Uh, right. And uh, as people sit down on the cube, they kind of become part of the uh, part of the loop, you know, part of the, the movements of the pedestrian. As with most video work, Joe's pieces run on a loop. And I've always been curious how an artist decides when the loop is done. I, you know, if that makes any sense. Even the artists will say they have no beginning or end, but there clearly must be an artistic end point in the process. Yeah. Well, most of my work is a uh, infinite loop, so it's seamless. So there's basically no beginning and no end. Mm-hmm. Um, and how I decide the length of the piece is, um, you know, normally um, by d- depending on the footage that the source footage that I have for the project. Um, mm. You know, like sometimes, you know, if it's, um, for example, the the piece um, Underground Circuit, I filmed the entire piece in the subway station in New York, and uh, because of the restrictions in a public space like that, I really couldn't film for a very long time. So I think mm. each loop is actually about two or three minutes uh, each take. Uh, and then I had to, you know, click my camera and tripod and jump on the train and get to another location. <laughs> yeah, to to avoid, you know, um, the the policeman sure. <laughs> to give me a ticket. Yeah. So um, because of that, that piece itself is a three minutes uh, it's a three minutes loop, but there's no beginning and no end. Like I said, right. so the viewer can walk into the piece anytime they want to, and then you know, and then can enjoy the piece as long as they want to or as short as they want to. Mm-hmm. And and you know as I mentioned, you you can really they're mesmerizing. I mean, you can really spend quite a bit of time with them. But, um, they're enjoyable that way. Technology can often get in the way of creativity. The artist is just trying to get the fucking thing to work, or it can get in the way of the experience when you're looking at a work and you can't get past the technology, and then, and it drowns out the idea, leaves you cold and unmoved. Joe's work, however, incorporates our familiarity with technology and the fact that we are bombarded by images every minute, but she somehow is able to find the humanity in the cacophony of daily urban life by using images that on their own would be heartless. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. I think as a video artist, uh, I also, uh, you know, have like concern, like you mentioned, about technology being kind of too much, you know, playing too much a role in my work. Uh, right. I, you know, obviously for me, it, 
technology is the tool I use to execute my my concept. Um, but I almost want the technology to be invisible um, mm. because I, at last, you know, it is the content of the work um, that's important. You know, it's it's like you said, it's a humanity, um, and that's what I want to showcase. You know, because in my work, uh, it's kind of like this collective rhythm or like the collective humanity that we have. Um, so I think. For me, uh, regardless, it's going to be a video work or it's, a, it's an installation work. Uh, I want the execution to be kind of as perfect as possible, so that people don't really, you know, see the projector or see the kind of the, mm-hmm. the equipment, um, but really kind of immerse themselves into the work itself. We are accustomed to moving images being accompanied with sound, but most of Joe's work does not incorporate it, and I asked her why. It's a tricky thing, though. I mean, I mean, uh, I always like um, puzzled by the, you know, by the role of sound in the in video work. I, I think, uh, on one hand, it's very important. I think sound uh, sound art is is one of, uh, you know, most direct art form because it just gets to you, right? You hear it. There is. It's not like you, when you read a book, you kind of have to understand the language and you digest it. But sound is like direct gets to get to you and kind of invoke emotions. So I'm very careful about using sound in my work because sometimes I feel like that could be overpowering the visual. And, and in that case, I'd rather to have it to be a silent piece. And some other piece uh, that requires sound uh, because that can help enhance the concept of the work. And that's when I work with the sound artist to, you know, to incorporate sound in my video. Mm. Yeah, I, I I can see that. I you can um there the without sound they're almost more poetic or lyrical, like you say, like a book. And yeah. um with sound they're more um cinematic. And, yeah. and you experience them more like a film as opposed to um something more literary, I think. Yes, exactly. Uh I th- I think like again because my work is not narrative, you know, so um, so I I think that if I uh, when I want to incorporate sound, it really has to help enhance the mood. So the mm-hmm. the sound and the visual really has to work together, uh, and it is hard. And I'm I'm not a sound artist, um, so I have a vision, and uh, you know I I would hire uh, a sound artist who has who knows about the technology of sound to work with me. And it, it is um, a collaboration. And uh, um, I so far, I've only had a few pieces that had sound in the work. Uh, and actually, uh, the work you just mentioned, When the East of the Day Meets the West of the Night, uh, mm-hmm. is a piece that absolutely requires sound in it. So I'm working with a Japanese sound artist right now to uh, make the soundtrack for the video. And it's going to incorporate a solo cello um melody um in in the in, in the video and it's gonna be uh executed by my mom who's a cello player. So oh. so yeah, so it's kind of an interesting component that's gonna be added into the video and it's also gonna be like a personal component because, you know, my mom obviously uh lives in China and uh, we can see each other. So I want her to play a, a piece of cello uh, so that I can incorporate into my art. I'm working on that now and should be out in like about uh, a month or so. The project is actually a two-part video series. Um, and uh, I finished, uh, you know, we filmed the first part, which is the sunrise and sunset part. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we are editing that one and with the sound. Uh, and the second part, which is going to be the moonrise and moonset. Uh, and I haven't being able to finish filming the moon rise uh, in China because of the travel ban. So mm-hmm. I I don't think I will show the piece until I can finish the project. Uh, but in the in the, in the meantime, uh, you know, I'm gonna um, kind of uh, get the sound down and also trying to talk to different venues to see you know which which venue would be the best one to premiere the piece. Speaking of sound, in her work Midtown Flutter, Joe assembles moving images in a cubist collage. But for some reason, 
It actually brought to mind Mondrian's famous painting titled Broadway Boogie Woogie. You know the one, the crazy quilt of squares painted in primary colors that seem to zip around a grid that's evocative of a subway map. Yes, yes. I, I mean, you, you like that's exactly in you know, one of the pieces I looked at too uh, when I was working on that piece, and like just the you know the 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 fact the the concept of rhythm, um, mm. you know, like in that piece, um, is is essential. You know, I think like rhythm is like an essential element of time-based art, and also a major fascination of mine of the built environment. Um, so it's it's not just in that piece, Meet and Flutter, but as you can see in all my work, you know, there is kind of this rhythm that's embedded in the scene that mm-hmm. I capture. So for for Meet and Flutter, uh, I shot a variety of architectural elements in Meet and New York, and I allowed the passersby to interrupt my scene. And then I select the and compose the video footage Based on the formal quality of the architecture, um, but the piece, uh, you know, the video kind of invoke like a syn- syncopated rhythm as pedestrians move horizontally through the vertical patterns of the built environment. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of this uh, rhythm of hide and seek. Um, and also, it's just the rhythm of the city, you know, because it's a chaotic city. And uh, and some sometimes when you when you watch people move for a long time, there's this rhythm that come across, and I think that's the rhythm of the place. Yeah, for sure, that definitely comes across in the piece. I also suggested to Joe that her work has a voyeuristic aspect to it, but she was not so sure. I, I um it kind of depends on the works you know in, in some for some work uh I I was like really far away you know from the people that I I film but other work like Meet and Flutter I was right there you know with the pedestrian uh, so I feel like uh, I was not just uh you know an outsider but I kind of becomes like an insider becomes part of them. Uh, so that's kind of interesting too. Yeah, and I, I'm, I was not only the person who watched them, but they also watched me back too. <laughs> and uh, so there's this interesting exchange. And I think that's kind of the most interesting part of the project, you know, the fact that I, I feel like I've become part of the piece. Jo mentioned that her work is not narrative, but clearly a narrative is implied and it creates a powerful hook. As a species of storytellers, we're compelled to make up a story. And even some of her pieces are titled Plots, which of course has meaning in a literary sense, but also as just a physical space. Right, yeah. I mean, I think um, it's kind of open-ended. You know, like once when I capture um, the, the scenes, uh, the activities that happen in front of my camera, uh, Sometimes I, you know, I, I, I don't know, like I, I'm not sure if there's anything really interesting in the things I'm capturing uh, other than kind of this ritualistic moments. But when I'm back to my editing room uh, and I put the scenes next to each other and there's this interesting relationship uh, and uh, uh, almost kind of like a micro-narrative that happened, you know, so I'm, I think that's that's one of, the, um, one of the moments when I'm like, okay, I need to put these two things next to each other, you know, because um, because they, you know, they just work together, uh, almost like a narrative. Um, but you know, there's a lot of room for imagination. Um, so I, I think it's 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 what kind of what viewer um, perceive um, on themselves. You know, this kind of meaningful and interesting pattern uh, and juxtaposition that just come across when you see two things next to each other, you can help, but you want to relate and relate them, you know, want to figure out what's going on. Yeah, so like I'm trying to kind of take advantage of that kind of uh, psychological, um, you know, um, tendency of people and uh, just play with it in my work. I wondered if the tension to which she referred was due in some part to the intersectionality of her own Chinese heritage as well as her new home in Chicago and as well as her training in both fine art and computer science. You know, I grew up in China, and my 
earlier uh, when I was a child, you know, my earlier training um, did focus on traditional art practice. Uh, I, I did a lot of drawing and uh, just uh, a lot of uh, um, brush painting. Um, but uh, I, um, my family felt that it was more kind of a pragmatic direction for me mm -hmm. to study technology and computer. Uh, and uh, interestingly, instead of pulling me away from art, uh, it eventually kind of became an, like an euro gateway to propel me into a more contemporary realm of art making. So uh, when I came to the United States, uh, you know, I was uh, a, a computer science student at that time, um, but I picked up a camera and I started shooting. Um, so I was doing a lot of black and white photography at the same time while I was pursuing a computer science degree. Uh, and that kind of led me to pursue uh, MFA at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so it was really not calculated. Uh, and I just, you know, after I finished the computer science degree, I just decided that um, I, I, I really want to kind of fuse uh, the more artistic side of myself and the more logical side of myself. Growing up in Beijing, Zhou was the daughter of a cellist and a music producer. Early on, they encouraged her artistry, but they also hoped she might be more pragmatic than they had been and were pleased when she pursued a degree in computer science in the States. I, I definitely think I have my artistic genes, you know, come from my family, um, but also... Um, they they were encouraging, but they were also you know worried about uh, you know the practical side of life. Uh, so I was uh, sort of you know I, I decided that I was going to study computers, but then you know everything changed when I, when I came here. Yeah. In addition to pursuing her own art, Joe holds an influential position as the curator of a unique ongoing project in Chicago called. 150 Media Stream. The work being shown at 150 Media Stream is well worth a look, and you can learn more about it at 150mediastream.com. Joe tells us a bit more. So for for the um, for that installation, we feature digital artwork on a monthly basis, and we not only work with artists, we also work with organizations. Or universities, and we will feature um, students' work as well. So it's a, it's actually a really interesting platform, um, and a lot of different type of work um, from different artists or institutions can coexist on this platform. So I'm really proud of the art art program that we developed. The website is 150mediumstream.com, mm -hmm. um, and whenever we feature a new project. Uh, the home page of the website uh, will be about that project. And we also have an archive page where you can see all of our previous projects. Um, yeah, so actually we, we are going to launch a new project on Monday featuring American fiber artist Bisa Butler's work. Uh, and she's currently having a solo exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago and we are doing an offset exhibition in conjunction with her solo show at the museum. So we're really mm -hmm. excited to kind of bring her work into our venue. Uh, it's really kind of a bold, colorful um, portraits of um, black uh, um, of black people. And so it's it's a really right moment for us to do that, uh, and also just a celebration, you know, of uh, the narrative of black life. Yeah. Mm. Wow, sounds fascinating. As if that's not enough, Zhao is working on a brand new piece called Love Letters. It's a collaboration um, with a choreographer and two movement artists. Uh, mm. So it's a four-part video series, and the series features a blossoming relationship between a couple, and, and it is set against various sites that are characteristic of Chicago. So it's kind of a love letter to the city where I live and dream. Mm -hmm. um, so we just uh, recently finished the f uh, filming the first episode of the series. Uh, for that episode, uh, the two dancers stood on the opposite side 
of the Chicago River and faced each other, and they kind of created an intimate back and forth dialogue using body gestures. Um, so it's, it's it's very the the uh, the choreography was really expressive and rhythmic, almost kind of like a sign language, and, and there's also. Um, the dancers also inserted their own interpretations with elements of uh, improvisation and mimicking. Uh, so, like I said, the work was obviously inspired by the quarantine, uh, with kind of this separation and isolation. Um, mm. But the concept is kind of is about interacting from afar and longing to make a connection. Um, so, for me, you know, like working with three collaborators and sharing our creativity with each other uh, really has been one of the most fulfilling experience uh, during the quarantine. And we did like a lot of Zoom rehearsals. Um, so it's really fun actually uh, working that way. Yep. I wanted to avoid asking her about what it was like to be a Chinese artist in America at this particular moment because I think such reflections are best after some time so you can gain some perspective. But when I asked her if there was anything she'd like to add at the end of our conversation, she had these thoughtful remarks. Oh, thank you. I, I mean, I, first of all, I just thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I think, I guess, I mean, a lot of people have asked me, like, you know, what, I mean, how I feel about um, being an artist uh, at this time or, like, uh, you know, being a Chinese artist in America. Mm. Uh, but I think one of the most interesting or intriguing aspects for me of the American um, cultural, American urban city is uh, the cultural diversity, you know, and the people's openness to that diversity and uh, its impact on uh, people's behaviors and lifestyle. So uh, as, as a Chinese and an immigrant with a relatively more reserved cultural upbringing, and this has inspired me to um, to be an artist here and to interpret the American culture and scenery from a perspective of an outsider and a part of also a part of this diversity. So I think ultimately, you know, I believe that uh, you know inherently we are the same. You know, we we kind of shares uh, shares the same core humanity. Um, you know the the longing, the loneliness, uh, the joy, uh, is something that we all share as human. So I'm kind of strive to celebrate that in my work, and I I just hope that people can you know can can feel that, and uh, you know and we can celebrate that together, you know as human. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, and and that well you've. Uh you've accomplished that. It's, it definitely comes across. Thank you. You've been listening to another special report from Art Report Today. My name is Michael Delgado, and my guest has been the visual artist Yugo Joe. You can see clips from her videos and learn more about this fascinating artist on her own site, yugojo.com. That's spelled Y-U-G-E-Z-H- O-U dot com. This has been a production of Art Report Today. Find your inspiration in the arts every day at artreporttoday.com.